Welcome to 80s TV Ladies, part of the Weirding Way Media Network. Please note, we recorded our interview with Paul Kreppel before the SAG after strike, and we stand in support of the writers and actors strikes. It's 80s TV Ladies Time, where we look back in order to leap forward with your hosts, Susan Lambert Hedham and Sharon Johnson. Hello, I'm Sharon. And I'm Susan. I'm so pleased to continue our look at the 80s sitcom It's a Living. It's a Living, also known as Making a Living, was created by Stu Silver, Jenna McMahon, and Dick Clare, and produced by Wit Thomas Productions. It ran on ABC from October 30th, 1980 to June 1982, did successful in reruns enough to become a syndicated show from September 28th, 1985 to April 8th, 1989. Between the broadcast and the syndication run, 120 episodes were produced over six seasons. It's a Living was an all-female situation work comedy set in a fancy restaurant at the top of a hotel skyscraper, the Bonaventure, in downtown Los Angeles. It's centered around the lives of the waitresses, the cook, the manager, and the wise-cracking piano player, Sonny. The first season starred Anne Gillian, Susan Sullivan, Barry Youngfellow, Gail Edwards, Marion Mercer, Wendy Shaw, Bert Remsen, and our guest today, the wise-cracking piano player himself, Paul Kreppel. He's a multi-award-winning actor, director, and producer. He starred in the national tours of Jerome Robbins Broadway and as the wonderful Wizard of Oz in Wicked. Paul starred in all 120 episodes of It's a Living. He also directed six episodes and directed several shows in the 80s and 90s, including Simon and Dave's World. And he has directed numerous stage productions. Paul won the Tony Award and Ovation Award for co-producing, directing, and conceiving the show, Jay Johnson, the two and only. He has served on the governing bodies of Actors' Equity and the Screen Actors Guild and is a teacher and guest lecturer for acting and directing. Paul Kreppel, welcome to 80s TV Ladies. Thank you so much for joining us. What a pleasure. We're really, really looking forward to having this conversation with you. And vice versa. I know. We started even beforehand. <laughs> I know. Well, the 80s, that's when I was doing most of my television in the 80s. So I, I, I'm here to Fantastic. talk. And the show I was on that was mainly uh, women-driven. And you are 80s ladies? Did you grow up? I, I, that, now I'm going to ask the question. Sure. Did you grow up watching uh, TV in the 80s? And that's oh, yes. an impact. Oh, yes. Or did you just like the rhyming quality of the 80s ladies? We grew up watching a 80s television. I grew up watching 80s television. Sharon and I met in the 80s through a mutual friend talking about mutual love of movies and television. And so we've known each other for, for a long time. And <laughs> during pandemic, I my husband and I started rewatching 80s shows and 70s shows. And uh, I was like, God, I have a lot of thoughts and questions and things. And so I called up Sharon and said, do you want to do a crazy podcast with me? And she said, yes. And so we've had a lot of fun. We have a, a group of crazy kids <laughs> called the 90s TV babies that come on and then give their opinions. We show them episodes from these shows and go, what do you think? So it's just been really fun. And then we've been able to talk to amazing people like you and Sharon Glass and Tyne Daly and Stephanie Zimbalist mm -hmm. and Robin uh, Bernheim and writers and creators. And it's been just really neat. How fabulous. Yeah. But how are you today and where are you currently? Because you've been on the road. Right now, I am in, I am in New York uh, for the week and I leave tomorrow and go to Chicago for two weeks. Because I am on tour. Well, we don't call it a tour. Uh, I am traveling with the Broadway company of Into the Woods. Uh, and we are doing some exclusive sit-down engagements around the, uh, the country in some wonderful cities. So we opened at the Kennedy Center. 
after after checking up in Buffalo, which was a beautiful experience actually up there. They have a gorgeous 3,500 seat house that we we just you know rehearsed in for a few days and, find, and put the finishing touches on before we went to the Kennedy Center for a month. And then we went to Boston in a couple of weeks, which is where I began my career. So that was thrilling to see some old friends and to walk the streets where I used to live many years ago. And then Philadelphia, uh, which was also lovely. I hadn't spent more than 10 hours in Philadelphia before. And we just spent a week in Charlotte, which is a lovely town where I also got to see some friends, some 80s television, 70s and 80s television friends who lived down there. And some people that I toured with in Wicked who also are living down there. Oh, who did you get to see? Who lives down there? Um, I don't know. Am I allowed to say that he lives down there? Yeah, why not? Fred Grandy lives in, in Charlotte. You know, I was thinking about him he recently. He spends a lot of time traveling. He's yeah. doing theater. Fred Grandy from Love Boat. Right. Yes. I was wondering and about I'm him. And I'm touring with his daughter, Mariah. Wonderfully talented woman who I've known pretty much since she was born. How neat. So oh, my gosh. Cool. And now I'm back here for a week and I go to Chicago. So she's in Into the Woods? She is one of the Wonder Studies. We have a team of Wonder Studies, and that's what I am. They asked me to join the Broadway company when they moved to Broadway from Encores, and they had gotten amazing reviews. It was going to be the first show on Broadway. They called, they said, would you Wonder Studies stand by for the mysterious man, narrator, and and actually, and also the steward, which is a, a, a fun role. And... And I said, be the first show back after COVID, doing Sondheim on Broadway uh, with Brian Darcy James, Sarah Morellis, Philippa Sue, uh, with an amazing cast. And then even the people who came in to do it, F. Cheyenne Jackson came in and Andy Carl and Krista Rodriguez. Uh, just an amazing group of people. We have more fun. And right now we're doing it with Stephanie J. Block and her husband, uh, uh, Sebastian Arcelis. They're doing it with us on the road, along with a lot of the people I already mentioned. Yeah. And we're having the time of our lives presenting a beautiful production of a beautiful show. I have heard so much great stuff about this production. Nobody paid me to say that. And you're with Diane, Diane Fallon. I am. Diane is playing Cinderella and she's just a dear friend. I adore her. We've been doing it since the beginning. She was a, one of the Wonder Studies who, who took over. Uh, and I'm a, I'm still standing by I, I for the person I've known him for almost 50 years who uh, created the role uh, of the mysterious man narrator. And he is a wonderfully mysterious, mystical, magical creature and a wonderful singer. We worked together, as I said, 50 years ago. And so it's fun for us to uh, to be in the same show again after all these years. I am so impressed by actors in general like i've been around actors all my life and i still think it's magical what actors can do and in particular the understudy holy crap how, like there's no time you don't always get a rehearsal <laughs> it's you're you just have to be ready to go at all times i my hats off to you uh yeah and there are times when uh, especially during previews when you're starting where you haven't had a rehearsal because through putting on the show, you don't, you don't really get to rehearse as understudy till after a show opens, really, unless somebody gets sick or unless there's a reason for you to. And so the people that have gone on have been pretty amazing, just being able to watch, take the notes, and be ready. And boy, they have ice in their veins these days. I mean, I, I came from a generation we got nervous before. We also didn't have any musical theater programs. So if, these people are trained at such a high level. They are humanoids. They all are quadruple threats. They all sing, dance, play a musical instrument, and act. Sight read. You know, it's really a different breed of, of performer. And uh, I take I take my hats off to them all the time. It's I, I don't remember being surrounded by this much just glorious. And it, it feels like they did background checks on everybody in the show. What a wonderful ensemble of people who are there to support each other. It's been beautiful. That's awesome. That's fantastic. That's the theater portion. Of, that was the ladies of ladies theater. No, we, we want to hear everything. So. I'm a big theater nerd, <laughs> so, so we got to always talk theater. And, and a creator. And a creator, you and your sister. Yeah. So tell us how you got started in theater and, and music and what your beginnings were in performing. Uh, you know, I came from a family that... There was some DNA in the theatrical tradition, but I didn't know any of those people. 
I, uh, I had an uncle who had been an actor, but he died before I was born. But I was singing and jumping around, and I wasn't acting. I mean, I, was, I would have been happy to be in the clown and do children's theater. And we would go on the weekends to the Catskills when I was growing up and sneak in the back of the clubs and listen to the stand-ups. So I was thinking, oh, this is interesting to me. Uh, and I learned a lot from all of that. I always liked comedy and music. And I feel like I was inspired by the people who did that really well in, in very different forms, whether it was Spike Jones or a man named Mickey Katz, who was Joel Gray's father, or Victor Borga, or Danny Kay, or Jerry Lewis. I mean, I can go on and on, or the Harmonicats. I mean, anybody who incorporated music, and Chevy Chase used to do some wonderful things that were musical, uh, and both musical in the Jerry Lewis kind of tradition. Uh, musical and and comedy uh, and like i really could find another gene balos another half dozen yeah the banana man i could really go on, and on about it. <laughs> you could we could have a podcast about it <laughs> yeah we could these are the people that really i went that really touches all of the things that i just love that i feel that i kind of vibrate to the song dance comedy i was doing that from the time i was like two mm. two and a half three i think um i performed on the stage when i was about three or three and a half i think i was a nervous wreck uh and then i sang with a, a girl from my hometown named Joni murphy and we used to sing together she was we were the same age these tiny little cute people <laughs> and she would sing i'd sing give me a little kiss will you huh which was an old song and she would sing my he's making eyes at me and then together we would sing the bells are ringing for me and my gal. <laughs> yeah, that was our little routine that we did. That's a l little storytelling. And we are still we are still in touch. We are still in touch. And her daughter is a wonderful writer who is the writer uh, creator of the show Made, which is uh, been up for some awards. Yeah, the May West. Yeah, it's great. Oh uh, yeah, Molly Miss. There's something about DNA. Oh yeah, absolutely. When did you start playing piano? I don't play the piano. Really? I saw that you'd gone to Emerson College in Boston. So I thought maybe you had I did. Um, taken some, were playing an instrument and wait. All right. So you actually did Emerson didn't have a music department okay. at, uh, at that point. I was always very musical, but I played accordion for about two minutes. I played, I, I play a mean dashboard of a car mm -hmm. and I was in a rock band and I did play a couple of songs on the organ that we use. I, I, I can kick butt on 96 tears. <laughs> and when I got hired to do It's a Living, they knew I didn't play the piano. I was going to say, did you say, did you do the actor thing? of like, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> no, but I knew that I could play some block chords and I said, I can do the pilot, Let, you know, because I knew what was in the pilot and it was simple stuff. But I walked on the set and by then, I think we rehearsed on the set and I, and I met all of those wonderful women and I said to the producers and my manager at the time, a wonderful man named Scott Shukat, he was a, a keyboard player and a singer. And so he was going to help me just learn some block chords because all I had to sing were like two little songs. They were, my character was an afterthought. They just kind of mm. threw in a couple of bits into the pilot after everything else was written. Um, and I was only going to be in six episodes. And then I ended up doing every episode. So that was a blessing. So I was going to say that... Uh, I looked at the set and I said, you know what? The block chords are not good enough. I, I, I'm, uh, I, coach, I can get through the pilot, but if this goes on, he, he should play better than I can play. I, and I think that he's a man who has great talent, but no taste. <laughs> and that's the way I explained it to them. And they, they liked that idea. And so after we got going, there was a, First, it was a, a musician strike, so that was very difficult because mm. I wouldn't work if they had a, a scab. And a Screen you know, Actors yeah. Guild strike. Was it around the same time? Actually, the Screen Actors Guild strike started the day before we were going to tape our first episode after we got picked up. So we had had camera blocking, I think. I'm pretty sure we had camera blocking, and then we shut down. Either that or we were going to have camera blocking, but we shot down that first week for 10 weeks, which was a blessing in disguise because I got involved with the Screen Actors Guild of doing a benefit at the Hollywood Bowl that I was one of the producers of. And we got everybody in the world to participate in that. 
And now I'm sitting in meetings without, I've been there for about eight months by the time September came around. And my show hadn't been shot yet. We hadn't aired anything, but I'm sitting in a room with all of these other people from television shows who I admired and been watching. And it's like, oh, I'm in Hollywood. And now I'm now I'm with all the people who are working in Hollywood on television. And I'm still very close to most of those people to this day. That was pretty much, that was amazing. That's pretty amazing. And yeah. because you got, so could, let's back up a little bit to how you ended up on It's a Living because you had just come to LA from what I've read. Yeah, I, um, I moved to LA in July and my agents basically in New York because I was starting to really build a nice beginning career of, of theater in New York and doing musicals. And, and he said, you know what, give me three months and come to LA. So I did. And I had never been, but I had friends out there. So I got off the plane and I felt the weather and I knew where my head was at that point. And I said, this is going to be good for you. This is going to be good. I just needed that other, that next step or other step. I've always bounced around. So it was another, another community that I could go and, and live in. And uh, all the people I knew embraced me and I started meeting people. And I think the first job I got was... Just one line on a thing called Moviola, directed by a man named John Ehrman. And it was about looking, and we did the episode I did was because there were three short movies when they were doing like movies of the week. And I think there were three of them. It was called The Scarlet O'Hara Wars. So they were looking for the woman to play Scarlet O'Hara. And my scene was with Tony Curtis. So the people who are watching your thing, watching you and your show probably know who Tony Curtis is. I'm always amazed that younger people had no idea who Tony Curtis is, was until I mentioned his daughter, Jamie. And I had a scene with him. And I just, not a scene, I had a line with him. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't have been nicer. And I said to the director, John Ehrman, can I look through the camera? That was my first day in the first job. And he looked at me and he went, sure. I wanted to look through the lens. Because I directed theater and I knew I'd be interested in doing it. And it was a lovely experience. And that was the first thing I ever did. And Barry Youngfellow, who became possibly my best friend throughout the uh, It's a Living Years, played Joan Crawford on that. And we didn't know each other yet. So, I don't know. Everything ties together. And it was cast by dear people who are, their family is now my dearest friends. Uh, it was cast by Pat Harris. And I had met her. And she just you know, found a way to give me a line. She said, I like your voice. And I got a line make, making delivery to, to Tony Curtis. And I'm still very close to both of her daughters man, to this day, who are both in the industry. You know, it's, um, I like people mm -hmm. and I like the energy of what I do. I like the creative energy of performing arts. And if I wasn't having this career that I have managed to bounce around and, and have, I would have been happy doing anything else as long as I was in the movie. Mm. That is so cool. So well, let's go back to how you got on It's a Living. Do you remember? Well, fascinating enough, uh, one of my agents, a man named Peter Young's sister, Rhonda Young, was the casting director for It's a Living. And when... <laughs> <laughs> you got to see this guy. <laughs> and when they added the character, she called Peter. I don't think I had met Rhonda yet. and. He called me right up because he knew that I had just come out from LA, from New York where I was doing a lot of musicals. And they said they need somebody, and he knew I could be a jerk, and they need, they need somebody who's going to be a lounge lizard on the show. And they don't really know what he's going to do yet, but, you know, they just want somebody who can play that kind of uh, similar to a Bill, the Bill Murray character from Saturday Night Live and also... Lily Tomlin also did a character like that. And I did have something in my pocket that was similar to that, that we used to play around with a couple of my theater friends, a man named Bill Parody and G.G. Gibson, doing a show together. They would walk around and go, hey, baby, you know, holding a cup and a cigarette in their hand and being a lounge act. And uh, I kind of played with them. And so it felt like a real easy thing. I was in an improv group, so I had been developing characters over the years. That was how I started my career. And I was always musical, like I said, and I knew the keyboard. So once they brought somebody in, the person who did most of the shows was a man named Paul Smith, who when he wasn't with us, 
He walked in and I went, I don't know if this man can be in my hands. He was about six two. He looked like an ex Marine. He had a shaved head and he said, hi. And he was one of the most extraordinary players on the planet and had done a lot of television over the years. And he couldn't do all of our shows because he also was Ella Fitzgerald's penis at that point in his oh, life. Well, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Nothing yeah. like that. <laughs> but they allowed me to orchestrate everything. I, I think I showed them that I kind of knew what I was doing. And uh, they would basically give me a song and maybe a joke within the song or before or after and gave me free reign. They told me that it was always fun to come down to see the run through just to see what I would come up with. Because they, I'd see it, and then I'd go over to the prop guy and I'd say, "Give me a clown nose, a gong, and a, you know, and a, and a kazoo." And two seconds later, I'd have these things, and I would just create. It was magic. It was uh, maybe one of the most fun things I've ever had to do in my life. We've gotten a chance to do. Well, it, there's so many musical numbers in that show. Like I was sort of surprised looking back at it again. How much is you playing piano bits? It was a part of a big part of the show. Yeah, and then they just. Because the talent uh, that you guys had, there's total musical numbers in these episodes. It's fantastic. Well, you've got Marion Mercer, who won a Tony Award for Promises, Promises. Gail Edwards was a musical performer. Crystal Bernard recorded. And Anne Gillian also, when she was in Sugar Babies on Broadway. And when I first met her, she was doing a musical in Chicago. And also Shirley Ralph, you know, who has never stopped and has always been a force. God bless her. And she came in, you know, she started... I didn't know her when she did Dream Girls, but we got to do some things. I love the Attila the Hun musical, which, you know, I, my character could not be done anymore because everything I said was inappropriate. My character was always sitting on the women, and I just watched an episode the other day, and I said, boy, you really are, you do cross the line. But I was not, um, I was not an imposing kind of person. I was not really any bigger than any of them. I mean, I'm not short, but I was slight. And you always kind of knew that he was very insecure. He wasn't kind of, you know, in their face. And it didn't come out in a way that was like, it, it was silly. And they would just look at him and go, oh, please. Well, I think there's one episode where she keeps slamming your fingers. <laughs> 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 We have we have clips of how many times my fingers got and, and I always had to try and come up with a different reaction. I think my favorite was on the bench. It happened and I sat I stood there and then I just went totally backwards. <laughs> so I think they you could hear me falling on the floor or something. So I did like that that they gave as good as you they got mm -hmm. from you. And I think that's one of the things that evened it out. Um and yes. again, it was it was clear that you weren't getting anywhere so it sort of defanged that the venom of of what in other situations might actually be oh yeah no that's sexual harassment <laughs> yeah and i think and i think it was clear that we all kind of liked each other yeah and that which and, shows and that you, you know context is key in in situations and it's all about not just what's said but how it's said who says it what situation? And I think in this situation, I, I perhaps um, in a slightly different direction, but I think this kind of a character definitely has a place, whether it be in sitcoms or, or elsewhere, because they exist in the world. Um, and it, I think it, there is a way to, 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 to do it in a way that, that speaks to today's sensibilities. I'm not a writer, so I don't know how. I can't tell you. Well, I love you said it that way because it's true that to ignore what, what people are. Mm hmm even if it's people you disagree with or to think that they have no right to be that unless they're really doing harm to people. It's like, you know what? Um, those judgments really aren't necessary. I, fe I feel like, like it's Game of Thrones. There are these people who live a totally different kind of existence than you. And, you know, that's their culture. And as long as you're all on the same page about something, you know, I've always said that, you know, is it really going to take us to be invaded from outer space to get this planet to, to let down their guard about each other? I don't know. It's a very tumultuous time. And I think it's hard because people are, people's lives are at stake in, yeah. in, in real things. So it's. We're getting into a very philosophical discussion. Yes, we are. <laughs> Let's get back to the wacky ladies. Well, it's, of... it's how the world has changed. And, yes. and the way what we're talking about is the, is the way the world has changed from those times. Well, and I, and I'm curious, 
I'm curious in, in the eighties, you're working around all these amazing ladies and these, this amazing talent. And you're basically being kind of the, you know, the Schmidt in new girl, you're, you're being kind of a jerk, right? Yeah. How, how did that play out just like amongst you? Like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I, I think for the most part, we all had just major crushes on each other as a team. We all loved each other. We all worked together. We all played together. And there's some people that I, st- I still see. Well, I just lost Barry. And I say I because it was very personal. She was a dear friend. And her husband was somebody who uh, I knew before I knew Barry. You know, he, he was uh, in the improv group, Sam Freed. And, and she, had, she had gone through enough. And it was time, and it was, but it, was, it doesn't make it any easier to lose those people. And I, I think of Marion Mercer, who was maybe one of the easiest going, most brilliantly talented comedians. Uh, like I said, she wanted Tony for Promises, Promises. And everybody just adored her. I was, I was directing once, and it was like, what could you say to, what could you say to her? I was directing, and I came out, and I gave everybody notes, and I said, oh, Barry, and Gail, and I looked at Marion and I said, Marion, nice dress. And I walked away. <laughs> now we had fun and we were there to support each other. The four last seasons we did the show, we had no audience and we had no network. Mm. And so we just were on the set, keeping an eye on the monitors for each other. When people would come in, sometimes new directors would come in and everybody would be like, well, you know, it was really an amazing team. I think it was Tony Thomas, one of our executive producers, who said this was sitcom heaven. And uh, and he was the reason it came back on the air. And my character was the reason you didn't see the show for the last 25 years before that. Because they had to go back. You said there was a lot of music. Oh. To use it, they had to negotiate with each owner of every song. And you had to track them down. So there were a good hundred songs tony went to paul brownstein who does all of those shows his name is on the end of all of those shows that you're probably watching because he got the rights to him and he edited them he edits them for the format and he has to make adjustments tony said this is a show that we always love that's never been done would you want to take it on we don't really even have a record of the songs from the 80s and you did so many and they were they were big songs that you were singing. Like, it's not like, oh, this obscure uh-huh. song. Mm-hmm. You're doing big stuff. Sometimes, yeah, when we could. Uh, I think we lost seven episodes when he made the transfer just because he said he had to go and find these people. But he said, look, this is just, you know, it's favorite nations. Here's yeah. how much I can pay. And if they said no, it was like, okay. He either took it out of the episode because they had to make them a little shorter anyway, or if it was integral to the plot, we just, he said, well, this is one episode we won't be using. Oh, that's so interesting. Wow. I hadn't thought of that. That went into it. He spent a lot of time and he got in touch with me and he said, I just want you to know I'm editing these shows and you are making me laugh. And I, and so he and I have become friends since then. So that was kind of sweet. That was nice to hear. That is so nice to hear. And, and it's one of the things we talk about when we can't figure out why a show doesn't have outing. It's like, okay, it might be the music. Mm-hmm. So it was off the radar. We were off the radar for like 25 years before it came back. I think infamously Wonder Years was one of those shows that had a lot of clearance issues because of the music on that show. Hmm. And sure. for some reason, China Beach is coming to mind. I mean, wow. mostly 80s shows. Obviously, this was before the the VCR came along. Sharon, that's very good. I haven't heard China Beach mentioned in in, <laughs> in 20, you know, 20 years. Yeah, I could be wrong, but... Was Seal Award in China Beach? For some reason, her name just popped into my head when you said it, but I don't remember. Dana Delaney. I know Mark Helgenberger was, was one of the nurses also. Oh, yes. That, I mean, maybe I'm thinking of actually... Um, of Mark. And of course, this was a time when, when one couldn't watch all the shows. Susan mentioned uh, our mutual friend who introduced us, and I used to tape some things for her... Because she wasn't able to tape them for herself. Well, and also, I, it's a, because she went, like, like we needed to tape something on ABC and CBS. Because we were, we were both in film school at the time, our, our friend Brittany. And, and so I'd be like, okay, I'm going to tape this. 
<laughs> you tape that and then we'll trade tapes. <laughs> now, we, now we can do all of that. Yeah. In the 70s, if you were doing theater in the 70s, you never really saw any television because you were working during prime time. Right. And you had the way of taping things necessarily. And so I think some people were telling me that they had never, I had never seen The Odd Couple, which was even before that. The television show because they were doing theater and it was like that was good i was like yeah the show <laughs> just because you hadn't seen it didn't make it not good you just were to see it until later on it's it's been interesting to be alive and old enough to pay attention to all these things as this evolution has happened from you you see it or you you watch it when it airs or you miss it to everything just about at your fingertips except some of the things from from back before they had to think about clearing things like music yeah. and having music rights um it's 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 been very interesting you're at the beginning of that journey mm -hmm. imagine how i feel <laughs> <laughs> i pretty much remember the beginning of television i mean maybe not the first day but i, <laughs> I was like you i saw i remember early 50s television because I was from upstate New York and Schenectady had one of the first stations, uh, W, uh, RGB. I, I don't remember. Don't, don't, I won't quote you, but I remember dinner time, 6 30 to 6 45, I think it would be the Earl Pudney trio or quartet would play dinner music for 15 minutes. But I remember that name, Earl Pudney to me is like a great name. How do you forget that? <laughs> you don't forget things like that. You know, so I I just remember watching a lot of the development of TV, the experiments, you know, the Ernie Kofaxes and and Sid Caesar and, uh, and all of the beginnings of these creative people who were experimenting with with the form and coming up with some really unique things. And so I'm I'm curious, speaking of the creators. The creators of of It's a Living were Stu Silver. Oh yeah, we're supposed to talk about It's a Living. Living. <laughs> I know. I'm going to keep bringing this back around, but I love hearing about all this other stuff too. Did you work closely with Dick Claire and Jenna McMahon? I believe that that was an idea that they had, and they approached Tony and Paul. They were never involved. I think they bought me. I don't know how the arrangement they made, but I think it was their idea. And then Tony and Paul decided to do it about eighties women, and uh, and then they brought in who else's name do you have there? I have a. Uh, um, I know that the Tom Whedon came on. I think later seasons. Yeah, I love Tom. Yeah, and um, and his family. I, I actually am still in touch with his kids, Josh and Jeb, and well, Josh, I saw at his memorial, and we had a nice long talk. Is Josh? Uh, came on the set when he was like in his early 20s a couple of times and he was around and I remember him well. I like people's kids. I like knowing people's families. I like just to, to see all of that. And so that I was, I felt very blessed that I got to just be there for Tom's memorial because a dear man. And he used to write, we got to a point in the show, the last two seasons where they were trying to save some money. All of a sudden an episode came along long and I didn't have anything to say. And I went, okay. And then the next episode didn't have a song. So I went in to see them and I said, okay, guys, um, this is me as really an observer of the show. It's going to sound like it's me, the ego of Paul Crapple. But one of the unique things about this show is my character sitting down and doing something silly. It's an energy that isn't integral to this show that doesn't exist in any other show and they went yeah we just didn't want to spend too much money on getting the rights to other songs and so tom out of uh he was a harvard guy who used to write for harvard lampoon and he would do all their hasty pudding shows he said i'll write some songs and i'll do it for you know whatever the minimum cost would be and so he did so the attila the hunt is something that he wrote, or there would be songs about girls that, you know, somebody would say, hi, this is my friend, you know, whatever. I can't even remember the names of the songs, but then I'd write a song about them, and it was always some silly, funny, and he would write them all. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And Mark Sotkin? I Mark saw Sotkin. His... Yeah. Mark Sotkin had been on Laverne and Shirley. Uh, he may have been around there when I did my next job after, no, that no, two jobs later. But the first time I really had a nice role on a, a sitcom was Laverne and Shirley, and he Ooh. was over there. 
And so this, this, let's talk about Laverne and Shirley for a second, because it is a show that se- technically started in the 80s, but I mean, 70s, but ran through the 80s. How yeah. was that show to work on? And how were those ladies? I was there when they were having a tough time with each other. Uh, they, I mean, I'm, that's not a secret. I think that no. there was a time where they were not having a good time. But boy, the minute the cameras rolled, they were brilliant with each other. Yeah. I mean, they weren't fighting. It was just a little chill in the air. You know, but, that, but it was a fun episode because I think in the episode, I think that uh, Penny was going, which she was very good friends with Art Garfunkel and it was her birthday. So, and it was the Beatnik show. And all of a sudden, Art's now in the show. And so I'm there working with Art Garfunkel, who being a, an old rock and roller and an old folk singer, uh, I love Paul Simon and Art Gar- Garfunkel. And it was just thrilling for me to be there. But the night of the show, at the table, because he was in the show, her other friends were there. And I think it was uh, Terry Gar, was it John Hurd? Terry, I had already met once and just thought that she was just one of the most lovely, funny, adorable, smart people on the planet. And I think she probably still is, although I haven't been in touch with her in a few years, a number of years. So that was magical to be a part of that show because it was a hit show at the time. But when the cameras rolled, they were magic together. They really were. And then you worked on a Remington Steel. <laughs> I did a Remington Steel with Pierce and Stephanie and Stephanie... Uh, because of other people in our lives have kind of remained friends. And that was kind of a cool thing to be able to do. I got to do some, some fun hour stuff actually. Uh, and that was, that was one of them. I didn't like my performance in it, but I thought that the show, <laughs> but I always liked the show. It, it was a, it, like, that was a good show. I would say that was one of the goofier episodes, I think. It was the television. Well, if I was in it, then it was a good episode. <laughs> That's how you know it's a goofy episode. <laughs> Paul Crapple's in it. Now it's going to be goofy. Paul. Faith Prince, who is a, a Broadway person, a, a wonderful actress who won a Tony when she did Guys and Dolls. She played my wife on that. And whenever we see each other, she always says, Paul was my husband on the first television that I ever did. Uh, <laughs> nice. And we actually stay in touch, too. And she's she's a delightful person. Yeah. One of the fun things about going back and revisiting these shows is catching glimpses of somebody, of people like Faith Prince and others that you go, oh, oh, you know. Yeah, she was doing little, she was doing little shop at that point. You know, there, it was a great time to be out there. Certainly for me, it was a great time to be out there. The things I got to do, whether it was Love Boat, Fantasy Island, you know, to do Fantasy Island with Bob Denver. Oh, fun. Fantasy Island. Welcome to Fantasy, Fantasy Island. Island with Bob Denver. How was that? He was so sweet. We had a really good time. <laughs> we were talking about he. It's a Living was on the air for a few years at that point. It had been on and then off and And he said, I really like your work in, in, in that show. And I said, and I go back far enough to remember you from Dobie Gillis playing Mary G. Krebs. And he went, oh, it's, that's nice to hear because everybody always says Gilligan, Gilligan, and which means a lot to me, but you know, it's nice to know that people know me for other things. And then he started talking about being pigeonholed. He said, you know, because yeah, it's so hard to, to break out when you're recognized and thought of as being one thing. And I said, oh, I know because, because of even just doing it's a living, it's like uh, every role I get is for somebody wearing a tuxedo. And I said, once I got hired to play a magician at a wedding. He wasn't wearing a tuxedo, but you knew he owned one. <laughs> <laughs> and we laughed about that. And then the AD came over and said, OK, first team, you're in. And we were getting ready to go in. And the guy said to, <laughs> to, to Bob, Bob, are you going to wear that hat? He said, I got to wear the hat. If I don't wear the hat, nobody's going to know who I am. I went, oh, Bob, don't you know what you just said? <laughs> Our conversation was just that. <laughs> it's a chance not to wear the hat. <laughs> He was a doll. We had a good time. Yeah. And Apollonia was on it before she was Apollonia. Her name was Patty Cotera. And I haven't seen her in forever, but the last time I ran into her, I went over and said, hey, we did. And before I could get it out of my mouth, she says, I know who you are. We did Fantasy Island together. She was lovely. Oh, my gosh. That is fantastic. And, and that's actually another thing that's changed about television these days, because back then, you, you know, you would see 
actors on Fantasy Islands and guest starring on other shows while they were doing their show. And there's just not a lot of that these days, probably because of scheduling and people have other things to do. But I kind of miss that, too. It's kind of yeah. fun. It is kind of fun. But now with all the streaming shows, people can do three series. Mm hmm. We're doing three series. We're going to make these five episodes here, and then you're going to go and work on that show. But because of my union involvement, I ended up knowing a lot of people. But one night I was leaving, and people said, oh, Tom Hanks is here to see the show. And I went, you know, if I have to go, no, he's here to see the people that did the show. And I'm not going to, I don't want to go and say, have to remind him of who I am. I haven't seen him in 30 years. So I started to leave, and they said, oh, and Martin Short and Andrea Martin are here. I went, Okay, I got to go back in. I went to college with Andrea, and I've known Marty forever, and they both are Godspell people, so we're part of that same universe, and I had just been in touch with them. So I, I walked in, and, and, you know, they yelled out my name, and I went over to give them a hug, and I looked at everybody else in the cast, and I said, I told you I knew famous people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm known as the person who knows everybody in the business. And then Tom and I talked for two seconds, and he, we already went all the way back to doing promos for ABC. He said, you know, I think we probably were good actors. And I, first of all, that Tom Hanks would even put me in a sentence with him as being a good actor. And he said, I think we probably were good actor, actors, but I think we got hired because of our hair. Because he remembered, I mean, we both had hair. Yes. <laughs> and when he was doing Bosom Buddies is when we were doing the first season of It's a Living, so... And we had this similar same director, so we, we knew each other through those times. Oh, that's right. And that was just such a treat to see the three of them. And uh, yeah, at one point, I said to Tom, I said, we've got to get a picture. And he said, yeah, yeah. So I looked at Marty and said, Marty, I want to get a picture with somebody famous. Would you take it? <laughs> <laughs> but we got a picture of all of us. And Tom is looking in like he's, he's uh, photobombing me with Andrea. <laughs> and he's like. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. You know, it, it's because these people just have such good spirits and they're all just a joy and the laughter. You know, these are people who enjoy doing what they do. I don't think anybody would disagree with knowing just how passionate and caring Tom Hanks is mm -hmm. because he expresses it a lot. But Andrea is the same way and Marty's the same way. You know, they, he, they just love what they do. And that makes it a treat. And my cast in, in Into the Woods is filled with people who love what they do. And we support each other. Every time a new person goes on in a new role, we meet right before the curtain, get in a circle. We do a whole thing with a circle, you know, just to lift them up and then send them into the woods. And uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty beautiful. That's awesome. Okay, back to, back to TV in the 80s. Back to TV in the 80s. Well, actually, I have a question. Yeah. Speaking about us a living, can you tell us how um, it came about that you began directing some episodes of the show. Sue Silver was the one who created my character. He's the, he the other name you didn't get to on the list of the writers. Stu Silver, who now lives in Rochester. And, and we just saw each other a couple of years ago. And I started directing because I had been directing theater and I was interested in, in, in pursuing it. And I just started following people around. And a lot of it had to do with Jay Sandrich, who was my mentor, maybe one of my dearest friends. Uh, he was my father, uncle, brother, friend, mentor, dear, dear man. Lost him about two years ago now. Mm. And he really, and we fought. The first time we saw each other, he, he would tell the story about how I, I got in his face about something. And then by the end of that day, I was in love. I just thought he was just the best person I would want to know. And... So we had like a what, 40 year relationship in terms of just being dear friends. And he mentored a lot of people. Jim Burroughs credits him with having mm -hmm. with the career that he's had. And just a wonderful man who taught me uh, the TV ropes. And so that was part of my deal. We, you know, we did it for two half seasons. And then I was even thinking of moving into production. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they said, you, we're going to do the show again. Do you want to do it? And I said, and they had already talked to other people. And I said, I would love to, but I would love to direct. I'd love to be able to direct. And they say, we will do everything we can to make that happen. And because Anne was going through things when we first came back that first season, uh, they said, you know what? We're going to be around more than one season. So 
we don't want to put any stress on anybody. Not that it would have been, but I said, I understand. So the next season I got to direct, I think, two. And then the next season, three. I, I forget how many. IMDb says six. You directed six, I think. So I did direct six. Yeah. And then there were a couple of compilation shows. But I was ready for it, and I knew the entire crew, and I knew the cast, and they were there to support me. It was the best way to be able to get into it. It was just always something I was interested in doing. That's fantastic that you were able to get that opportunity. Yeah, And I still direct. And we, wrote, we created a show with Jay Johnson, who was on Soap, who I knew. And we, we approached him about creating a show for him, my girlfriend and I. And we did. And we didn't. It's always, To me, it's always about the process. My goals are not, you know, build it and they will come. Or they won't. And it's never about the result. It's like, was it a good process? Did you feel like you created something? Then if 10 people saw it and, and found it great, great. If uh, a million people did, I guess better. As long as it was a good process. So we went to Broadway with Jay's show, which was pretty darn wonderful, if I do say so myself, because he was so compelling and he's so good at what he does. And uh, it was a hard sell on Broadway, but we won a Tony. We won a yeah, special so. theatrical event Tony for that show. And so tell us a little bit more about that. I mean, winning a Tony. Yeah. Did you think you were going to win? Well, there were only two things in the category. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. But they still created the category because they said both shows are worthy. So let's do it. Uh, we didn't know. We really, it was, it was a toss up. For our listeners, this is Jay Johnson, the two and only. Is that the name of the show? Yeah, and actually, when the show is 17 years old, uh, there is a video of it that is on Amazon, actually, you can rent it. And it's, it's pretty representative. I think they did a really beautiful job. I was not involved with the, with the actual making of the video. It's when I was on tour doing Wicked and having a blast doing that. I've gone back to doing more theater, but I'm, I'm looking forward to going back to L.A. And Pasa, I want to be the old man. <sighs> I want to be the old man. People say, well, first of all, you, you seem younger than you are because I, I am getting old. And I say, but you know what? I don't mind being this age. I've waited a long time to be this age. <laughs> <laughs> so you think this is, this is one of your ages? This is yeah. one of your good ages. Oh, I've been playing the old man for 50 years, but now I actually don't have to put on any makeup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what the future is for me in terms of... Uh, how much work I'll be doing. I, I don't pursue it. I, I never really did. I don't pursue it, per se. This thing fell into my lap on Broadway. I had an audition for it when they did it at Encores, and I got a call on a Friday saying, you know, very quickly, we're moving, they're moving to Broadway, and the casting people who had done Wicked uh, thought you'd be great for it. Are you interested? But the creatives don't really know you. They want to hear you sing, and I couldn't. They couldn't find anything on YouTube, and I went. There's about 120 half hours someplace on YouTube. But, <laughs> but they're 40, but they're 40 years old. So I said, "Well, when do they want to hear it?" And they said, "Well, you have to make them a self tape now." So I had a. Mer I got all this equipment here for self tapes, but it was like now. Okay, I had a Murphy in my phone. I picked up my guitar, which is over my shoulder, someplace. Mm -hmm. I see it. That's the neck of the guitar. You see the neck. It is. I picked up my guitar. I sang one verse of an eight, of a 60 song, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Don't Let the Sun Catch a Crying. I sent it to them Monday morning. They said, you start tomorrow. I said, that's my Broadway audition. That's my Broadway audition. And I got it. <laughs> nice. I'm going at this the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> you got to just like throw it out there. You know, it, and it's been a treat. It's been a treat. Uh, and I have two amazing kids. What, what more can I say? I felt very much a part of, of uh, the television scene in the 80s uh, and the relationships that I have out there. I miss the people out in L.A. because I've been in New York since before COVID most of the time. You did one season with Louise Lasser. I'm curious about that. Oh. <laughs> now, Lu Louise is such a unique talent. She does what she does like nobody else. I always <laughs> said, and she's teaching. And I said, so Louise, if people know who she is, Louise was married to Woody Allen. She starred in a couple of his first films. She did Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. Uh, 
She went through some tough times with that while that was going on. They did a half an hour a day, and it was mm-hmm. a comedy. And after I got to meet her, I thought, wow, I, that that had to have been tough for her and everybody else. Uh, she 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 um, has her own way of doing things. I mean, I'm not here to talk bad about anybody. Uh, it, it was not easy. But I always said that if she's teaching comedy, because everybody always knows the you know, secret of comedy, you know, first of all, faster and louder. But Louise was brilliant. And I said, so for her, it would be the secret of comedy is slower and softer. You know, she was like, because she, and she'd be the only one who could pull it off because she was just so unique. At the first reading, you sit down and you read the script, and, the, and it's for the producers and the writers to hear it so they can go and make corrections. And she's just meeting us all, and she sits down, and Jay Sanders, they brought him in to direct the first episode. And her name of her character is Maggie. And so the stage direction is Jay reads it and goes, All right, everybody, welcome and welcome to Louis Lasher. Yeah, yeah. Maggie enters and crosses to Jan. And then Louis said, hi, Jan. Can I say Jan hi? Because hi, Jan seems very intimate and I'm just meeting her. So can I say Jan hi? And we all went, Jay said, sure. (laughs) And he said, Maggie enters and crosses to Jan. And she says, Hello, Jan. I feel that hi was too intimate. I wanted, can I say hello? And that's kind of what it was like for him. <laughs> and God bless her. She, she, I got along with her great because I, I just, I respected her talent and knew that. <laughs> that is fantastic. Everybody has their own process. Mm-hmm. And again, very unique characterization. It, it stands out and you're sitting there going, well, this doesn't feel like a, the right fit and yet somehow she's still hilarious in the show yeah yeah but it was and it was for one season and they changed the name i think they thought it's a living sounded ethnic and then they got rid of susan Sullivan. didn't get rid of they they did not bring back susan sullivan and wendy shawl and they brought in louise zach lasser and changed it to making a living yeah. So they brought a very New York Jewish sensibility into the show and got rid of these two, you know, chicks of goddesses. Yes, <laughs> yes it was but a very different cast ensemble. And I love that first cast. You know what? Every cast was pretty wonderful to work with. They were all just wonderful people. To, it was a treat. And we treated everybody that came in to be on the show with uh, more than respect. And it was something that some of us had talked about. Sometimes you would go to a show, you would walk on the soundstage or walk into a show. You didn't know where anything was or who anybody was, and you didn't really talk to anybody until you sat down to read. And every week, Gail and I especially would pretty much greet them at the door and say, craft services over there. You can use that phone. And in your, in your dressing room, if you need to know whether you need anything, just come to us. And then we would sit down, and by the time they would do the read, they would feel like they were part of the show. And that's the way we were trained. And that's, you know, that's the, to me, that's the theater way of doing things. And it's the way everybody should be doing things. Marion Mercer, I was there when she went to the network for It's a Living. And I think being in the room with her calmed me down because she was so nervous. And I already knew and loved her and was just thrilled to be standing next to her to go in front of the big shots at ABC at the time. And the fact that she was nervous. Kind of calmed you down? Yeah, it was like, well, if she's nervous, then it's okay to be nervous. And then I wasn't as nervous. Now, you're going physically into the network at the time. Yeah, when you go to the network, you basically sign a piece of paper that tells you how much money you're going to make for the next seven years, which makes your head explode because you've already spent it now in your mind. <laughs> you haven't even gotten the job yet. So now you're going to go. It's like, it's the 64, you know, it's, it's, I want to be a millionaire. The $64,000 question is the first question. It's all, <laughs> and there's no guarantees, but that's, you know, psychologically, but it's almost a test. If you can do that, then you're going to be okay on the show. I think is some maybe the way, I don't think anybody thought about it, but I, I'm very aware of psychologically what each step does. And when you're in there, don't expect them to laugh unless the head of the network is laughing. They're all kind of looking out of the corner of their eye to see if their boss is liking it. And then they'll all laugh. 
my God. And and so I am curious about that, like, because it's on for two seasons, you get canceled. And then we were off for three and a half years. And in that little lapse of time, somebody who is very good at syndicating things put a package together all of, of all of the Whit Thomas shows because they had four shows on that one year, Make Room for Daddy, Us. Uh, anyway, there were four shows or three. And they put them together as a package, Summer Gold. And they started showing it down in Texas. And our show started getting these ratings through the roof down there. And somebody said, let's syndicate it. Let's do it. Let's go after, let's work with Lorimar, which was a, a company that uh, I think was eventually bought by uh, Warner Brothers. And then and Dick Robertson was the president. And he agreed. And they ne- they left us alone. Nobody was there telling you I think that the person just closed or wrong, or I think, you know, nobody, they didn't have network executives. And I remember at one Christmas party, one year, at a Christmas party for Lorimar, I was talking to Dick Robertson, and he said, I really like you on the show. And he said, I think you guys may be around next year. He kind of inferred that we hadn't gotten, I said, from your mouth to your ears. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It was all up to him. <laughs> So you heard rumor that it was coming back before it wasn't just like a cold call of like, oh, we're back. Can we put the band back together? You kind of heard it was happening. No, they had kind of worked out a deal that if they could get certain members, I think, together, that we would do it again with the same cast. And we all loved doing the show with each other. It was it was it was like do it was like summer stock. It was like doing theater. It, it didn't feel like we were doing it. And there are shows that have that feel, and especially for a sitcom. You're doing a new script every week. You know, on an hour show, sometimes you don't see your co-stars. You don't see the people who are in the show because you're in a shot here and working with one other person. And sometimes you don't see the other stars because they are doing other things in that episode and it's locations. But when you're doing a sitcom, you show up on the first day of rehearsal, read around the table, and you hang out. It's different now. It's different. Now. I went and I observed on a show, and it was a little upsetting to me because I do love people. They were rehearsing, 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 and then it was time to say, okay, we're on a break. Well, when we used to be on a break, that's when we would talk to each other. You Maybe you'd get something to drink, you know, some water or a tea or go to the bathroom. And now when they say, okay, we're on a 10-minute break, everybody sits there and they take out their phone and they stare at the phone for 10 minutes. And then they go, okay, we're back. And I said, you guys don't talk to each other. <laughs> How do you get to know each other? <laughs> what a concept, <laughs> talking to each other. And, and, you know, that's a different time. Yeah. That's a different time. And, it's, and I understand it. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly saying get off my lawn, but it's me. It's, it's the experience that I've been through saying things that's different. I don't know how I feel about it. First, Angelian's like, you know, shot to fame. Like she became the sex symbol from that show in the first season, basically. Yeah. And that's kind of planned out that way. I oh, mean, she had done that on Broadway in um, Sugar Babies. She kind of took yeah. off playing yeah. that a similar kind of character. And she was good at it. And she'd been around for a long time. She's in the movie of Gypsy as little mm. baby June. Yeah. So she had a good theater background and she had done some film work. But it was kind of expected. With, with her character, I think. I don't think anybody was surprised. Uh, and she and I used to do some things for ABC together. We would go and do, and do stuff together and so on. And she was just a, a theater. She was just one of those people who loved hanging around. She was abroad. She was, you know, or, or the guys. You know, it's just those people who you hang around and the camaraderie there, and they're all talented. Uh, so, yeah, so she kept... She, she was the breakout character in terms of getting on covers of things. Uh, the other women were all all fine uh, and great and worked well, wonderfully well together. I'm still in touch with Gail. I have not seen Crystal and I adore Crystal. I haven't seen Crystal in years. I hope she's well. I run into Cheryl Lee because she we both did Wicked. She, I actually went to see the show because a friend of mine was going on in the New York company. And and I walk past the stage manager's office, and I see this beautiful woman sitting there. And I walked by, and and my friend said to me at the same moment, the stage manager said to her, 
that's so and so. They, you know, my friend is saying yeah. that's our new marble, Cheryl Lee Ralph. And the stage manager was saying, Oh, he 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 played the wizard at Paul Kreppel. And you could hear us both yelling out the other person's name and then running to each other. <laughs> <laughs> and she's a force. She knows what she wants and she just puts it out there and makes things happen. And I, I respect that. I respect that. All right. And so I have a couple of questions from my sister. <laughs> She's like, I have questions. So you can answer them or not, because they're not official from us. <laughs> okay. Were there any romances amongst the It's a Living cast? If not romances, maybe just dalliances. What's a dalliance? Uh, whatever what you want it to be. Dalliance. There was a lot of flirting. It was a lot of flirting. I had a crush on all of the women. And I think that there were times when they, maybe not all, but, you know, that it was reciprocal. But I, uh, but nothing ever, no, brothers and sisters, and, and just loving, because of the way my character interacted with them, anything that I said that wasn't, <laughs> just totally inappropriate was acceptable <laughs> you know so yeah there was a lot of flirting and a lot of playfulness and just we just we were there together it was a beautiful time i think for everybody i think in retrospect i don't think anybody could say that it was a horrible time or it was a bad time or a bad experience everything had moments we did 120 episodes but uh you know Barry always knew that my mother was obsessed with her hair, so she made me obsessed with my hair. <laughs> Barry knew I was obsessed, obsessed with my hair, so anytime there was a close-up of me that was like, okay, Paul, we're going to do a, just a shot of you. Anytime there was that, right in there, okay, in five, four, three, she would just walk by and go, you're going to wear your hair like that? And just keep walking. <laughs> and so it's like, Mm. <laughs> Might as well have said your flies open. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It feels like a theater troupe, right? It feels like you guys were very much a theater troupe. And then we had Dick Shaw, the you know the last four years, who was just dry and yes. wonderful and funny. And he and Marion together were magic. Over the years, that everybody made a contribution to the show. Every cast we had, and. Uh, it was always strange when they, you know, the first year when they made some of the changes, I'm not sure why. It certainly didn't hurt careers. Uh, Wendy has had a lovely career doing a lot of voice stuff. Uh, I think Susan has probably done seven seven series since then. Yeah, I and think I she don't... went on to Falcon Crest right mm -hmm. after that. Went on to Falcon Crest, and then she was on George Carlin's show. It's kind of a love interest for him. And then she was one of the mothers in Dharma and Greg. Uh, you know, and she doesn't stop working, and she is one of the most delightful smartest, just present, beautiful, a, a great spirit, a, a dear great spirit. So I watched a little of an episode and I went, we always had an A and a B and sometimes a C story in the show. Because the, the show moved around so much. Yeah. You didn't usually see people in the workplace really working while a show was going on. That was part of the energy of the show. You know, they could be there talking to somebody at there and then they go in the kitchen or they go into their lounge area. Uh, but it was called, the episode's name was Ginger's Baby. And playing the baby was my son, Will. Mm. And his name on the episode was Will. And he's an infant with a little nook in his mouth for most of it. And now he's 37 years old and I'm just sitting there looking at him. Yeah. Life. <laughs> that is fantastic. That was me whimpering. That was me whimpering, holding back two years of uh, of appreciation of a life well lived. And I don't even mean mine. I just whoever had a well lived life. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing so many wonderful stories with us. <laughs> I hope I shared some stories that are actually part of the programming. We were we went all over the place. We had a holographic conversation. We did. And we like those. Yes. And so do our listeners, mm -hmm. I think. So it's been fantastic to have you on. I'm so glad that uh, Gordon put us in touch and, uh, and that my sister met you. 
Thanks so much. This was a treat. You guys are great. Oh, thank you. Where can people find you online? Paulkreppel.com. I, I do have a website, paulkreppel.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter, Paul Kreppel. Uh, although my niece has become uh, very popular. Who's your niece? Oh, her name is Kelsey Kreppel. Oh. She's my only niece. So she's my favorite niece. Oh. Well. <laughs> I have two incredible kids. I really feel blessed. Oh, that's fantastic. That's great. And uh, my girlfriend wrote a play that we're doing a reading of. It's called Hoofers. And it's about dancers getting together for the 50th anniversary reunion of a Broadway show they did, which is now being having a revival. And when they did it, it was the 50th anniversary of the show's original production. So it's like no, no, net, net dancing, but they were doing it 50 years later. But it's funny and, and touching. And look for the theater. Okay, Hoofers. I like it. Hoofers, fantastic. Murphy Cross and her daughter, Fiona Landers, they wrote it together. Awesome. What a creative uh, family. You know, it, this is what I say to young actors. And I'm not the only one that says this. What else do you love doing? Mm -hmm. Do everything you love doing. Create other things. If, if, create, if creating is what you love to do, then find the other areas to create them. Don't sit around waiting for the phone to ring. If that means finding writers or directors, or actors who are like-minded, who inspire you, or that you're inspiring. Get together with them and create your own stuff. I'm in New York. I came to New York because I was in an improv group that had already been in existence, and I came in, and then I contributed to it. It contributed to me. It brought me to New York, and all of a sudden, I didn't know anything about the business. I didn't even want to come to New York, but now I have agents, and I'm being, you know, it's just, you've got to create the opportunities yourself, because I do know a lot of actors who the newer kids actually figure that out, but I know a lot of people sometimes don't. But, but stay inspired, and, and uh, some people just say, make sure you have a life, too. Yeah. Great Thank advice. You, and scene. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Susan. It's been a treat. Thanks. Take care. For our audiography, check out Paul's niece, Kelsey Kreppel, on YouTube. The link is in our description. Learn more about Paul at paulkreppel.com. Check out Into the Woods at intothewoodsbway.com. And that's all for this week's show. Tune in for our wrap-up on It's a Living, where Susan and I dive deeper into some of our favorite episodes and casts. We hope 80s TV Ladies brings you joy and laughter and lots of fabulous new and old shows to watch, all of which will lead us forward toward being amazing ladies of the 21st century. 